Based on the research done by a large number of studies, it is said that at some point in our lives, the idea of becoming famous will pass through nearly all of our minds, whether it be through a dream, a conscious desire, a fantasy, or a goal that we were actively attempting to achieve. It appears that to many, fame is generally associated with success, despite that not always being the case. For many current stars, becoming famous has happened through a stroke of luck, through a one-hit wonder, through a connection to somebody already famous, or in our present world, possibly even through an accident that has gone viral via social media platforms. Although the words fame and fortune are generally seen side by side, this does not necessarily mean that everybody that is famous is also in the possession of mass fortune. For example, in the current world, this could be due to a media platform having specific monetization rules surrounding the content that said person is producing. Although the content creator may have a large and quickly growing viewer base, very specific guidelines are expected to be followed strictly in order to actually make any money at all. To sum all of this up, sometimes the idea of fame and fortune is actually only one of the two. In other cases, however, fame and fortune is a correct and exact representation of the situation. But what actually happens psychologically to a person that achieves this level of fame and fortune? Well, it seems that for most, there is quite an intense mental process that is very common amongst those that have experienced this. This can be referred to as the phenomenology of fame. To break it down, some of the initial effects that one can expect to experience once becoming famous are a loss of privacy, an increase in demand of personal expectations, an increase in difficulty when seeking gratification to fulfill ego needs, an initial disconnect from previous spending habits, as well as an increase in the feelings of mistrust, isolation, and insecurity. There is also four temporal phases that each of these recently famous people will have to experience as well. These phases being love and hate towards themselves and the changes that they are experiencing, addiction to the increase of wealth, access and temptation, or coping mechanisms, acceptance of being as famous as they have become, and then adaptation to understanding the life that they have now found themselves living. For many that experience this rise to fame and fortune, processing the sudden changes is much more difficult, which may lead to an overindulgence or substance abuse problem, severe depression, or suicidal tendencies. Tragically, we have lost many to this issue. Although this process is extremely difficult for some, it appears that for others, it is quite a welcomed and comfortable process. At least, it appears that way publicly. Often, what the public does not tend to see or hear about via media sources is the effect that this life may have on the spouse and the family of said person. But I'll tell you, I'm a lucky man, uh, but I'd be nothing without my lovely wife, Bryn. Our anniversary's coming up, and I want to buy her a diamond necklace just to show her what's important to me. Family, friends, good times, Michelob. <laughs> <laughs> that should cover the necklace. This is Phil Hartman. You may remember him from such roles as Phil Fimple in Small Soldiers, the Marlax in Coneheads, Ted Malton in Jingle All the Way, Major Colin Thorne in Sergeant Bilko, and numerous roles in Saturday Night Live. Well, I hope I've answered your questions as best I could, given the very little that I know. <laughs> How could one so perfect be so flawed? Dearest. Not now. I'm busy. So for Franz Pimmick. Franz, of course, the civil engineer from Zurich, whose wife is expecting a baby any minute. <laughs> you know, I'm surprised to see you. I didn't think we had anything to talk about. Or even Troy McClure from The Simpsons. Hi, I'm Troy McClure. You may remember me from such nature films as Earwigs, ooh! Many fans consider Phil Hartman's role in The Simpsons to be one of his best and most recognizable, simply because Troy McClure's voice and bravado were so similar to that of Phil himself. Many also consider Phil to be one of the greatest Saturday Night Live cast members of all time, alongside Mike Myers, Chris Farley, David Spade, Adam Sandler, Tina Fey, Chris Rock, and many, many more. For those that have witnessed Phil in action, it would be hard to deny that Phil had an outstanding ability to control the stage and captivate the audience. Although many of his fellow Saturday Night Live counterparts shined by using their energy and charisma. Now you kids are probably asking yourselves, hey Matt, how can we get back on the right track? 
Phil's talent seemed to shine through his charm and confidence. This will happen to you, because you got a little boy too, but if you ever have a girl, you become an instant feminist. Anybody gets in the way of my little girl. None of this glass ceiling stuff. She's going straight to the top of the executive pool. <laughs> Phil had an impressive ability to maintain the features of himself that fans grew to know and love, while also morphing into the many different characters he portrayed throughout his career. Although Phil became many different characters, it appears that to many of his fans, the most exciting part about watching him play these roles wasn't to see a comical Bill Clinton or a goofy caveman, but instead, it was the opportunity to see Phil Hartman on the TV or stage once again. Now, let's start at the beginning. Phil Hartman, a.k.a. Philip Edward Hartman, was born in Brantford, Ontario, Canada, on September 24, 1948, to mother Doris Margaret and father Rupert Lobig Hartman. When Phil was only 10 years old, his family moved to the USA, living in Connecticut, and then California, USA. When he graduated from Westchester High School, he went on to attend the Santa Monica City College, but dropped out in 1969 to join the road crew of a rock band. A year later... Phil married his first wife, Gretchen Lewis. Just two years into the marriage, in 1972, Phil and Gretchen separated, and Phil went back to school to obtain a degree in graphic arts at the California State University Northridge campus. He went on to become a fairly successful entrepreneur as a graphic designer developing logos and cover art for over 40 albums for bands such as Crosby, Stills & Nash and Poco and & America. In 1975, just after Phil turned 27, Phil found himself growing more and more interested in comedy. He then began taking an evening comedy class ran by the Groundlings, which included other well-known comedians such as Paul Rubens. As Phil's interest in comedy grew, he found himself using it as a way to express his creativity and his confidence. He would frequently attend the Groundlings comedy show, and then one night, mid-show, Phil was asked to join them on stage. Phil stole the show. It wasn't long before he was invited to join the act and became one of the group's most well-known performers. Phil even went on to work with Paul Rubens in the development of several characters, including Pee Wee Herman. In 1979, Phil began voice acting in the animated series Scooby-Doo and Scrappy-Doo. He had also had his first on-screen debut in the musical action drama Stunt Rock, which was released that same year. A year later, in 1980, Phil played in a series of smaller roles, such as The Six O'Clock Follies, and The Gong Show Movie. In 1981, Phil Hartman and Paul Rubens staged a live performance of The Pee Wee Herman Show, which was later broadcast on HBO. One year later, in 1982, Phil married his second wife, Lisa Strain. Just three years after that, in 1985, Phil and Lisa divorced. One year later, Phil went on to co-write the scripts for Pee Wee Herman's Big Adventure, as well as the TV series Pee Wee's Playhouse. He even joined the cast of Pee Wee's Playhouse as Captain Carl. This same year, 1986, Phil was set up on a blind date where he met former model and aspiring actress, Bryn Omdahl. They married quickly, only one year after meeting. Over the next several years, Phil Hartman's career began to explode. He went on to voice both Henry Mitchell and George Wilson, aka Mr. Wilson, in the animated series of Dennis the Menace as well as playing a role in the Hollywood film Three Amigos alongside Chevy Chase, Martin Short, and Steve Martin. It was that year, in 1986, that Phil's run on Saturday Night Live began, in which the rest of the cast nicknamed him The Glue due to his helpful, caring, and considerate attitude. Over these years, Phil also played roles in Blind Date, starring Bruce Willis, Quick Change, starring Bill Murray and Gina Davis, and, as mentioned earlier, Coneheads, starring Dan Aykroyd, and his long-term role as Lionel Hutz and Troy McClure on The Simpsons. After his run on SNL, in 1994, Phil Hartman began his three-year run as Bill McNeil on the TV series News Radio, in which Phil received a TV Land nomination for this role. By this point, Phil had already received the Primetime Emmy Award for Outstanding Writing in a Variety or Music Program for his writing on Saturday Night Live. It was around the beginning of Phil's time on SNL, in 1986, that Bryn and Phil began their relationship. As Phil's career continued to become more and more successful, Bryn's toxic traits became more and more apparent. Bryn already had a lifelong history of abusing substances like alcohol, cocaine, and narcotics before meeting Phil. But it seemed the pressure and envy of Phil's fame began to exacerbate these issues. Bryn quickly became very jealous of Phil, 
and would constantly nag at him to pull strings in his workplace to get her as many roles as possible. Although Phil welcomed Bryn to spend more time backstage or on the set of SNL, it wasn't long before she came very resentful of his inability to land her in any quality roles. She would constantly flirt with other SNL cast and crew members. She would also ask several of them to try and assist her in the search for acting work. Her substance abuse issues escalated and her emotions became unpredictable and overly reactive. When Phil and Bryn would get into arguments, Bryn began becoming slightly physical, throwing things at Phil, including dishes and alcohol bottles. It wasn't long before Bryn would attempt to receive treatment at multiple different rehabilitation centers on multiple different occasions. However, Bryn would always relapse and begin abusing substances once again. Between the years of 1988 and 1992, Bryn was relatively clean in comparison to her previous years. She became pregnant with Phil's children during these years. After giving birth to both of Phil's children, Sean Edward in 1989 and daughter Bergen Anika in 1992, Bryn quickly became unstable once again. She began making constant assumptions that Phil had been unfaithful to her. She even threatened Phil's ex-wife, Lisa Strain, with bodily harm. There is zero evidence to this day that Bryn's claims of infidelity were true, accurate, or warranted. Likely due to Phil being known as the type of person that would avoid confrontation, combined with the instability in hostile environment while he was around Bryn, Phil began to spend more and more time on his own. He would fly his plane or go out in his boat fairly regularly, which appears to be ways he could get away from the constant negative energy that Bryn would bring around him. Despite the distance this seemed to bring to the relationship, it is fairly apparent that neither of the two were seeking a divorce. This activity kept up for several years until early 1998, when Bryn went through another treatment facility, and upon release, she appeared to be attempting to get a hold of her addiction and emotional instability. May 27, 1998. Bryn began drinking during the day, and then later that evening, decided to meet up with a friend for drinks at a bar walking distance from her home with Phil. She quickly became intoxicated and began to vent about her relationship with Phil and how she was no longer happy. Bryn began stating things about how she believed Phil did not care about her career and that she did not feel valued. As her friend was about to leave the bar, Bryn expressed her interest in keeping the night going and having a few more drinks. The friend could not stay out, so as they left, Bryn decided to visit her friend Ron Douglas. Ron and Bryn had previously been romantically involved with one another. During this visit, Ron has stated that he could tell that Bryn appeared desperate for attention. So, Ron spent several hours with Bryn before she decided to head home at around 12.45 a.m., which is the early hours of the following day, May 28, 1998. When she arrived at home, she instigated an argument with Phil. Due to her intoxication level, Phil told Bryn that if she started using drugs again, he would leave the relationship. After about an hour of arguing, Phil went to sleep in the master bedroom. While Phil was asleep, Bryn located Phil's personal Smith & Wesson model 38 caliber handgun. She entered the room and shot Phil three times, once in the head, once in the neck, and once in the chest. Phil Hartman passed away immediately. Later that night, around 3.30 a.m., Bryn drives back to Ron Douglas' house. She first asks Ron to please not get mad at her, and then she tells him that she murdered Phil and presented him the gun that she used to do so. Ron has stated that initially he thought she was kidding, but grew more and more concerned as time passed, and as Bryn was showing more obvious signs of intense instability. About two hours later, at 5.45 a.m., Bryn and Ron visit Phil's home, and Ron is frightened by the discovery of Phil's body laying in bed covered with blood. Ron walked away from Bryn and called the police. Bryn immediately reacts and locks herself in the master bedroom where Phil lay deceased. As Bryn was locked in the bedroom, she located another gun, this time a Charter Arms Undercover 38 Special. She quickly called her sister and asked her to please remind her children that she loved them. At this point, the law enforcement officers decided to break a window of the bedroom to try and distract Bryn. Bryn then pulled out the handgun, placed it in her mouth, and pulled the trigger. Due to the fame and interconnectivity resulting from Phil's career, this murder-suicide made headlines and shocked the nation. Not only was close friends and relatives mourning the loss of Phil, but many, many fans of Phil were mourning as well. Some of the friends and family of Phil and Bryn would state that on the surface, the relationship between the two wasn't as bad as many others would say. Some would say that there were zero clear signs that Bryn was terribly unhappy, while others would say that it was fairly obvious that her substance abuse would worsen on the days that Phil became more distant. Unfortunately, there isn't a much worse way for a relationship to end other than by murder-suicide. 
This alone leads many to believe that the relationship could not have been even the slightest bit happy or loving towards the end. Regardless of whether there was any happiness or love left between the two, they both made the decision to stay together and continue to endure these emotions until one day the emotions drove Bryn to the edge. Due to her instability and frequent visits to rehabilitation centers, it seems fair to assume that Bryn would have undergone full psychological testing to determine which disorders she may have that could be leading her addictive and volatile tendencies. Unfortunately, it doesn't appear that this was ever done. However, at one point, Bryn was diagnosed with a substance abuse disorder due to the frequency of her rehab visits. Since this was not done professionally before the murder, many professionals have since spoken out about their opinion of her diagnosis and what they believe Bryn was actually experiencing in her life. A common speculation that I have come across numerous times is the belief that Bryn had something known as Cluster B Personality Disorder. In Bryn's case, this contains features or characteristics from four different personality disorders. Cluster B Personality Disorder is made up of these disorders. Antisocial Personality Disorder, Borderline Personality Disorder, Narcissistic Personality Disorder, and Histrionic Personality Disorder. Using the information we know about Bryn, we can now break down the features and connections that some professionals have made leading to this speculation. For antisocial personality disorder, Bryn displayed an ongoing, repeated criminal behavior, ranging from substance abuse to physical abuse, harassment of others, and eventually murder. Bryn appeared to have become very impulsive, as well as making frequent, reckless decisions. Borderline personality disorder. Bryn spoke out often about her fears of Phil leaving the relationship. She would also display anger and described feelings of emptiness. She had mentioned multiple times that she felt like she was no longer pretty, due to her personal beliefs that Phil was cheating. In her final days, Bryn mentioned to a friend that she felt a lack of appreciation by Phil, and she believed that she would have excelled in her own film career already, which she had not. Some have speculated that since Bryn had recently turned 40, that she could have been experiencing some sort of midlife crisis at the time of the murder, with the beliefs that she was running out of time to find success within her dream industry. Narcissistic Personality Disorder It appears that many have speculated that Bryn was trying her absolute best to manipulate Phil. This could be due to a personal belief of elevated self-worth, believing that she was possibly special, or even fantasies and delusions that Bryn herself would experience overwhelming success in the same fields as Phil, if only she was given the proper opportunity. Bryn presented many signs of a high sense of entitlement, while also seeking to fulfill the need for admiration. Narcissists generally feel defined by their failures and experience difficulty when attempting to form any real, new relationships, as they generally will not present their real selves. Histrionic Personality Disorder A simple way to understand histrionic personality disorder is to imagine an on-stage actor. People with this disorder tend to be very overly dramatic. They exaggerate their emotions and expressions, but tend to be very insincere. They are obsessed with their physical appearance and constantly seek approval or reassurance. In Bryn's case, it appears that Bryn's desperate fantasy of achieving fame seemed somewhat tied to a belief that she possessed the talent or ability to do so. She would wear very bright clothing and became very flirtatious with Phil's co-workers, as if they could help her fulfill her beliefs. She also presented many reasons to believe she constantly wanted to be the center of attention. I have also read that Bryn would actively try to show her face in any shots of Phil that she was hired to be a background extra for, whom was directed to look away from the camera. This sometimes resulted in swinging earrings in pictures and videos. This is another possible indication of attention-seeking behavior. Though all of this does provide some possible insight into the mind of Bryn Hartman, and the possibility that Bryn may actually have been experiencing Cluster B personality disorder, it is safe to say that speculation is just that, speculation. Without a properly completed psychological exam and diagnosis, we will never know if what Bryn was experiencing could have been treated to the point of preventing this tragedy. With the knowledge we have of Phil's fame, and the knowledge we have of Bryn's rejection from the same industry, some may simply argue that this was an extreme case of envy and jealousy, which led to an awful crime of passion. Others may say, Phil's threat of leaving Bryn if she didn't quit the cocaine could have triggered a violent attack fueled by addiction. One thing we know for sure, though, is that although becoming famous is a dream we all have, fame is not as easy as it appears.
You know, I can't imagine a more dignified way to end my eight years on this program. 